We're floating like butterflies and stinging like bees. Rumble, you badass jet pilots, rumble. Hi, welcome to the Wingman Show. My name is Drew Brown. We hope to inspire, entertain, and learn something so we can all make this world a better place for our children. I'd like to introduce to you somebody who's my friend, my wingman, my main man, and I have a wingman watching my back, Dr. Paul Thompson. Hey, Paul, what's happening? Oh, not much. Hello, everyone. I'm Paul Thompson, and you just heard from Mr. Drew Brown, Dark Gable. He's the American dream. He's the man, the myth, the legend, the pilot's pilot, the role model's role model, and most importantly, his royal fullness. How are you doing today, Mr. Dark Gable? I'm doing great, and I'm glad I'm full of knowledge, Paul. I'm glad I'm full of knowledge. Well, we're going to have a great show right now. Check this out. Paul, 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 what's up, Dr. Paul? How you doing today? Doing very good. I'm educated, motivated, and hyphenated. I hope you're vaccinated is what I hope. I yes, know you been are. vaccinated. Been vaccinated I'm since off. March. I'm waiting for number three. Anyway, I'd like to tease a little something. At the end of the show, we're going to do our wingman story. And this wingman story is so important to the history of myself and Dr. Paul. What we're going to do today with our wingman story is tell you about some inspiration that really made me become the Navy pilot that I became. And that was one of people doing it before me. So I can't wait for you guys to hear about this our wingman story. I'd like to start out today with a story of I have somebody staying with me, my nephew, I call him BJ, but his name is really Emmanuel. He's an artist. He's uh, graduated from Loyola Music. He does rap. I say music, but he does all the music himself. He's for real. He just did a music video. Anyway, we were talking and he's 24 years old. And I kind of forget what it's like to be 24 because when I was 24, I had two kids already and it's hard to relate sometimes. But anyway, he was so excited about his video. And he said, man, I'm just looking for a thousand likes. I said, a thousand likes. He said, yeah, that's what I'm. I said, man, you shouldn't care about likes. And I started thinking about self-esteem and explaining to him. It's not how many likes. It's who who's the people that like you. It's not quantity. It's quality. And then I started really thinking, Dr. Paul, about self-esteem. Self-esteem is, you know, where it's all about, but it's called self-esteem. And it's how you feel about yourself, not how others feel about you. It's really none of your business how other people feel about you. And I know that's hard to hear sometimes and it's hard to live through. But this is what I've learned through all the years that I've been on this planet. What other people think of me is not my business. And actually, if when you start liking yourself enough, it doesn't matter what other people think of you. What do you think, Dr. Paul? Yeah, I think it's important that really you you do the right thing. Uh, if you're always looking for a popularity contest, then you're going to be appealing to the folks that will make you feel the best. Sometimes people make you feel the best are not telling you the truth. Uh, if you're a good person, be a good person. People will like you if you're all right. Likes, if you're in the, in the internet world, yeah, things go on likes. But if you're selling things, you're trying to make money or whatever, Likes don't buy you too much. You need to be, you need you need to have something reasonable to sell. If you if you're a musician or whatever, you need to be good at your music. So hopefully he'll get a lots of likes. He may or may not, and that might mean that he just has to, to you know, change something. No, and no doubt about it. Yeah. I wrote this, Doctor Paul. I wrote this, Doctor Paul. A true artist always gets paid. Right. Meaning. In other words, you should get paid for your work. And he understood it very quickly. He understood exactly what I was talking about. But I said, your job is to be an artist and to make music and to make people happy and to do your thing. You know, whatever happens and the way it's received, there's nothing you can do about it. And yeah. that that kind of uh, goes into, tell me about the change of life. We were talking about weather. Remember that? Yeah. And you you said remember. something very interesting to me. Why don't you go ahead and take it? Well, it's like weather and flying. But let me ask you first. I see something behind you. Is who, Who's that in the picture? Oh, n nobody's in this. You mean the T-28? Yeah, there's somebody. Oh, that's you. That's you. Okay. Salute. Yeah, okay. Well, who's to the right of you? Uh, let's see. 
looking at the screen, I guess it would be me many, many years ago yeah, when I was very young. Kind of easy to pick you out, a little darker than everybody else there, Paul. A little bit, a little bit. Good picture, though. I like that picture. Good picture. So back then and from then through your career at FedEx, think about this. You mm -hmm. wanted to bring up a subject about weather and just yeah. tell me what you were talking about. You know, one day I was uh, doing something and I was just thinking as they were going through the uh, forecast with some some heavy weather. This, this is like a couple months after I retire. There's going to be some heavy storms coming through the area. And I looked and I said, and I was worried about it. Then I realized, wait a minute, I, I don't have to go. I'm going to be home. I don't have to go anywhere. And I started, it came to me that most of my life, the weather had been in the back of my mind or the front of my mind every day, going to work, coming home from work, flying in different places, flying in the hotel. What was I going to have to deal with from the moment I stepped outside my house or hotel to the point I got into the airplane, flying en route, and what's going to meet me at my destination. You know, so weather forecasts were just a, a big part of everything. Uh, you know, if you're flying, you've got you've got uh, good weather is the best, but sometimes there's a lot of bad weather we have to deal with. Yeah, and we have to fly instruments. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that because a lot of people die because they're just used to flying in good weather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, VFR and IFR, visual flight rules and instrument flight rules, all professional pilots can fly, you know, instruments. That's a requirement in the training. Sometimes people don't. You're right. Sometimes they, uh, they're they VFR pilots and they get into a bad situation, like JFK Jr., John F. Kennedy Jr., uh, had an expensive airplane. He was flying at night, not qualified to do it. He died along with uh, two other people, which is very, very unfortunate. But uh, anyway, you know, we get into the situation where we're flying. There's stuff in route we have to deal with. Thunderstorms. We don't fly through thunderstorms. You fly around them. Oh, yeah. That's a misnomer when the yeah. when the air is rough up there or people are like, what the hell is they doing? We are trying to get away from yeah. whatever you're feeling yeah. as much as you are. I always told passengers, hey, guess what? We we like you guys, but we really don't care about you, but we care about ourselves. And if we live, you're probably going to live. Yeah, so it's 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 uncomfortable for everybody. Basically, if you're if you're getting a bad ride in an airline or whatever, that's the best path that we can they can find. That's the. That's the the best worst. <laughs> that's, the, it's, it's, that's the best worst you're going to get. No, no doubt about it. But that takes me back to the picture behind you, because when we were on the carrier, it was a whole nother world. You know, when you fly commercially, it's about money. When you fly what's behind you and what's behind me, well, mine's a trainer. But mm -hmm. what we both flew, it's about war. And they take a whole different level look at weather when you're talking about war than when you're talking about delivering people or packages, meaning you're going, you're going because there, this is the truth. Like, you know, there's, it's always the Bahamas up above, you know, you might have to go through 20,000 feet of horrible, but up above it's always bright and sunny. But I'm, it takes me to this one story on the carrier that I think is just hilarious this guy got in a lot of trouble, but this one day, this the airplane, I mean, the whole carrier was just pitching and heaving and up and down. It was horrible. And they wanted to send out a weather recce. Okay. And I don't know if it was an A7, but it, it might have been. It wasn't an A6. I knew that. It might have been an S3 or something. Whatever it was, right in front of us, you know, the, the screen that we have? Well, um, I just want everybody to get a picture of there's a screen right in front of all the pilots. Oh, the anyway, yeah, plat, pilot landing aid. That's correct. Whatever, a pilot landing aid uh, trainer or whatever. Perfect. So the plat is in front of us. So I want you to remember that when you took off from the carrier, you had to give a salute or at night you flip your lights. You let people know you're ready to go. Well, all of a sudden, this guy's not telling anybody he's ready to go. And he's, you know, he's he's up on power because God forbid he gets shot. He needs to go, but he's not saying okay. And the boss is going, hey, uh, 504, 504, what's going on? 
and the guy, the weather was so bad. You know that survival knife they give us, like it's gonna help. Yeah. <laughs> he said, "I can't get my survival knife out of my plat." He said, "It's stuck in my plat," meaning he destroyed a piece of equipment so he doesn't have to go. He's down. He was trying to make a joke out of it, but he's saying okay. he's not going. They okay. shot him because it was a joke. But he got in trouble because of that joke. I'm okay. sorry you didn't laugh. I hope people at uh, I hope people at YouTube and Spotify and the people who watch wingmanshow.com. I hope everybody else laughed. Okay, okay. I get maybe you had to be there to see it. Some things <laughs> are like that. Some things are like that. It's weird, but uh, obviously he survived. I guess he got out and he came back. Yes, that's important. Yes. Important. And you know, talking about important, so efficiency you know i'm 66 now i have this little saying that i have 34 more summers it's important because i'm going for 100 now i don't want to die at 100 anything after that's just bonus but i'm going for there right. i'm going for that 100 years old mark so in order to do that to me now time is precious it's the one thing we don't get back and the older i get the more efficient i am with time like instead of going back and forth 18 times, I try to find a way of doing it once or twice. That's just it. And I'm thinking about efficiency and time, and it's really made my life so much better. But then it takes me to dogfighting, believe it or not. I had to be efficient when we used to dogfight. You, okay? had, you, had, you had like real dogs, two dogs, two, two pets? No, we're not Michael Vick right now or Michael Vick Legacy, I'm sorry to say. And nothing to do with real dogs. I'm talking about air combat maneuvering, ACM, oh, okay. which we in the Navy, and I think everybody calls it dog fighting. I got you. So efficiency in dog fighting. I laughed at your joke just then, though. Okay. Efficiency I've... in dog fighting. Anyway, efficiency in flying means that you must take the best path, the best vector, which, which means a direct path to that opponent that you can so you can get behind his six. And that's kind of what wingman is all about, helping somebody who has might have somebody on their six to get rid of them. In other words, helping the guy out. But efficiency in the airplane, you can pull too many G's in an airplane. And you know that mm -hmm. meaning it's not how hard you pull, but it's how efficient the airplane is. Certain airplanes can't go past a certain amount of G's, G forces, even though you physically might be able to take them. Mm -hmm. So you have to fly efficient in order to win this fight. And you do fly efficient because it's your life that you're flying for. So you are not take whenever they teach you, you are really doing because the last thing you want is somebody behind you with a missile. What do you think about dog fighting and efficiency? Yeah. Yeah. You got to be efficient, uh, especially if you're in a, an airplane that's kind of thrust limited, it can only do so much and your opponent may have a better airplane. That's more powerful, more capable, so whatever you've got available, you better make the most of it. Didn't you beat a Tomcat, an F-14? Uh, just once. Just it doesn't once. matter. Didn't you beat them? Because that's all you need. Yeah, all you yeah. need is one time. Just just once. It was it was it was a freak occurrence. You know, as as what a fourth generation fighter versus a a second generation non fighter really. Uh, and, and, Tell and, us and, about it. Well, no, I had to do with experience. Uh, I remember the uh, one of the squadrons, their F-14s were new, and they were they were just getting used to them, really. And there was a, I, I sensed like a certain nervousness about pulling too much and the fear of getting into a spin or a flat spin. They were known to have uh, very, very tough spin characteristics. In fact, that's one of the things that led to the development of the uh, out of control program that we talked about on a previous episode. Yes. That's, that's where there were a number of losses. And uh, I remember they were pulling around. They didn't pull very much at all. And at that point I was, I was pretty experienced in the airplane and I could go to the limits and they weren't, they weren't operating towards their limits at all. So it was actually kind of, it was kind of easy. It's you like, are so uh, kind and humble yeah, in the amazing. Navy. You kicked his ass. That's yeah. what you used to say at the bar, but that was just one time. Every other time, no. They figured it out. No, it didn't happen again. Let me tell you a dogfighting story that happened on the ship with me. I flew against my commanding officer, who was a pilot. 
And we we were doing dog fighting. We were doing ACM. And you know, there's a hard bottom, 10,000. In other words, if you go through 10, you're fighting above 10,000 feet. If you go through 10,000 feet, you hit the ground. It's over. It's done. You you lost no matter where you are. If you go below 10,000, you hit the ground. It's called the hard bottom. Remember that? Yeah, the hard deck. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So when you dogfight with somebody, especially in the same airplane, because just like you said, you had two different airplanes, two different G ranges, two different powers. You had two different um, mechanical aircraft. When you're fighting the same airplane, it's about pride, ego, and can you fly that son of a gun? So anyway, him and I got into a dogfight, and for some reason, I mean, he's way more experienced than I was, but for some reason, I was on it, and I was about to pull on his tail. I was about to pull on his tail and shoot his ass down, and do you know that son of a bitch took me through 10,000 feet and kept fighting, and I said, hard day, he said, keep fighting, man. It's uh -huh. He didn't want to lose. No, you, you filming Top Gun or something? Or? No, we weren't. We were just, okay. uh, just filming wondering. a young rookie uh, beating the commanding officer in dogfighting. That's okay. what we were filming. I quit at the hard bottom because I knew I'd get in trouble. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just testing you, man. I was just seeing what <laughs> you were doing, the real thing. Anyway, I quit. We went back. And the cool thing, you know how you debrief mm -hmm. after each flight? Well, there was no debrief. So that's my dog. Yeah, it was real hard for us, Paul. You can say it if you want, not say it if you don't want. You and I were a little different. You were a very humble man. And back then, um, even now, I'm a little bit more, uh, uh, what would you call it, Paul? Uh, don't say crazy. I think, no, I'll say ebullient. I think, that's a, I think oh. that's a word. I think wow. that's a word. <laughs> I hope that's a nice word. Yeah, I think it anyway, is. Anyway, how about this one? You know, in New York. In New York, you are fired now if you're a health worker and you haven't had a vaccine. So talking about efficiency, and the governor said that she is about to bring in the National Guard for these health care workers if they lose their job. Bye, see, you got to go. Remember when they fired a bunch of air traffic controllers? Yes. Well, it's kind of the same thing. They're getting fired. American Airlines, if you are not vaccinated, you are terminated, period. Yeah, but yeah. in New York, how about this one? LeBron James just said he got vaccinated. Like he, he said he did his research, whatever. Anyway, he got vaccinated, uh, which I can't believe you haven't done a long time ago. But anyway, he did. In New York, you're not going to be able to play in Madison Square Garden or at uh, where the Brooklyn Nets play at Barclay Center unless mm -hmm. you're vaccinated. And now a couple of NBA players have said they're not vaccinated. And one of them said, it's none of your business. Another one said that he hasn't finished doing his research. So I have, I have um, something to say. Okay. This is a wingman PSA. If you smoke weed or you smoke cigarettes, 7,356 combustible compounds are going into your lungs every puff, every hit and if you're not taking the vaccine because you're doing research you are not smart you are not smart stop it and get a shot thank you there's been a psa from the wingman show okay yeah i heard that uh not about american airline i think united airlines uh they're getting ready to fire some people if they're not vaccinated and uh, as far as the NBA goes, that's the rule, I think, in New York and New York City and San Francisco. You can't participate in any professional indoor sports if you're not vaccinated. And I think the NBA said if anybody who misses a game because of that, they're not going to get paid. They're not going to get paid. For that's that right. So, you affect their money. Things change. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, a lot of things change. A lot of things change. So You know, when people say research, this is it. Dr. Paul, honest to God, I've actually had people look at me and say, well, I'm doing more research. If you're not doing scientific data with test tubes and chemicals and you're working with professional scientists, if that's not the research you're doing or you're using scientific actual evidence, 
like you're going through computers and actually using the data from scientific evidence. If you're not doing one of those two things, what the hell research are you doing? Because yeah. that's what it's called. 98% of the people are saying one thing, 2% on the internet or your friend said another thing. Okay, the smart thing is to go with the 98%. But here's the kick to Dr. Paul. It's now going to start to affect us. Sticker shock. The gas prices are going up. All prices are going up. Lumber's going up. Housing is up 20% over last year. Things are more expensive. If you want something for Christmas, you better get it now because people are going to be out of stock because truck drivers cannot be found. They do not have enough people working and delivering packages to keep up with the demand. Then the freight is not coming in from China because of the holdup, because of the pandemic. And people still not wearing masks, but now it's affecting everybody. You're going to start paying for it at the pump, Dr. Paul. Pay at the pump. Yep, you're paying now. Uh, you got all these ships at sea. I know in the, going into Los Angeles, it's like that. Uh, they've been there for a while. They said there's like 400... 400,000 seafarers, people are on these ships that have been dislocated. They can't do their jobs. They can't operate or some of them are trapped on the ships for the last, you know, X number of months because of everything that's just stopped. So this has affected, you know, hundreds of thousands of people just in the shipping industry from what I read recently. And the short well, it doesn't seem like people do anything until it affects their pocket. The problem is it's going to be too late by the time it affects your pocket, just like the weather we talk about, you know, just like education. You're doing you're trying to do something for the future. What's happened has already happened. The educational system, you're you're actually already have the hand that you've been dealt. We're trying to change the future. The weather patterns, you are not they're not going to get better. We just don't want them to get worse. But it's the same with this. Right. Your right. pocket will pay more and more until people get smart. Yeah, getting a shot. I talked to a friend the other day, and he said he's got a couple of relatives that won't get the shot because they're worried what's going to happen 25 years from now. And he said, well, I don't know about 25 years from now, but you might be dead in a couple of weeks if you get this. <laughs> you know, that's what he said to him. I said, that's a good thought. <laughs> you, know? you know, I said something in that PSA. Smoking cigarettes, 7,500 um, chemical compounds explode in your lungs every time you take a puff. And yet people are smoking cigarettes talking about ah, it, it's my freedom not to take the vaccine. Yet you still have to buckle up in the car. You can't smoke in restaurants. You have to do all those things, but it's your freedom not to wear a mask and maybe pass a disease on to another human being. Yeah. So remember I told you about 34 more great summers I want? Yes. Part of that is health. A big part of that is health. You are healthier than I am. You are my like role model. You did 100 burpees already this morning. So yes. you're my role. My, I'll go work out later, hopefully. My arms are so sore. You know, I have that good sore workout feeling when you do. Um, I was doing good. curls on the Peloton, uh -huh. and I really overdid it. When they say two pounds, I'm doing 10 pounds. Okay. So it's, it's, you know, not that I'm big or anything. I just went overboard. Anyway, I have that good soreness. But talking about health, I find this so interesting, Dr. Paul. They just came out and said it, it came out saying forever 21. And the study says that if you cannot fit inside the jeans that you wore when you were 21, hopefully 18 to 21, when you were a normal size, mm -hmm. that it doesn't matter how much you weigh. It doesn't matter what your BMI is. Your weight is not right for your body size. It made the most sense to me that I've ever heard since I've cut out sugar 95% or maybe 98%, and carbs, 92%. Since I've cut those out, I, my weight has not fluctuated a half a pound. And I really don't watch what I eat other than trying to eat healthy. Mm -hmm. So I think each one of us have a certain body weight. And I think the healthiest you can be is when you get to that body weight, not smaller, not bigger. And once again, self-esteem. Have you ever seen some of those models? Have you ever seen how sickly they look? I'm going to actually show some pictures on YouTube because yeah. I have some. It's disgusting, and they, they need to get thinner and thinner and thinner. It's not normal. Yeah.
And yeah. that's normal for life, not normal for good, bad, or indifferent. Last thing I want to leave you with this is that it seems that the less I make judgment over anything, the happier I am with everything. I wanted to make that statement. I thought about that today. In terms of fitting in jeans or whatever, that's a that's a nice, easy measure. People know whether or not they're in shape or not. It's a matter of what you're going to do about it. Are you going to try or are you going to just let yourself go? Now, you were talking earlier about, you know, folks, you know, smoking dope and smoking anything and hesitant about a vaccine. Well, same thing eating. You know, you're eating donuts and all kinds of garbage left and right that's making you blow up, messing you up your metabolic systems. You're all jacked up from bad food. And it's hard to make changes, but you got to make changes. Otherwise, you, most people are going to die early. You don't see a lot of really obese old people. Now and then. No, yeah. none. I'm yeah. sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Yes, I did. No old hundred year olds. No. Agree. 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 Yeah. You're going for a hundred. I'm talking about like much past 65, <laughs> much, much, much past 60. Some of them look old, but maybe they just, they look old because they just run down. That happens too. If you're really jacked up, you can look 30 years old if you got a rough life. Yeah, you know, this woman, this black woman doctor just told me black don't crack. Well, you also have to take care of that black in order for it not to crack. Got to put a little lotion on it sometimes. Right, but right. Meaning yeah. no matter what you think doesn't crack, you must take care of yourself. Yeah, yeah. That's if that's appearances. You know, it may not crack. It doesn't crack some cases. It, but Not it on the outside. It can expand. Right. It can be jacked up. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, I've seen folks who were who were deceased over a hundred, and their face, skin is as smooth as a baby. I mean, like oh, that yeah. the whole time. It all has to do with what you put in your body. Yes. But once again, self esteem. What did I do? What really changed my life is I started looking at myself honestly, honestly, not what other people thought. What I saw in the mirror. I say it all the time. Get butt naked. Look in the mirror and start changing one thing at a time. That's what I did. One thing at a time. And I took the worst and I worked on it. And with with time, things have seemed to have worked out. And I'm healthy now. I'm happy now. I love doing this show with you. Yeah, here's some wingman I'd like to mention. Wingman, my choice this week are the, uh, the Tuskegee Airmen. Tuskegee Airmen was a group of uh, black aviators from World War II. They were part of something called the Tuskegee Experiment. Long story short, this was during a time of segregation in Jim Crow, which was, I guess, kind of the law of the land from about mid-1870s to the 1960s. Uh, they formed a couple of large squadrons that flew primarily in Europe, uh, Italy, North Africa, uh, a little bit of France and England. But I had uh, the good fortune of meeting several of them and got to know one of them very, very well in a strange way. Uh, he was a famous fighter pilot. He was one of the first 12 Tuskegee Airmen that came through the program. And a little backstory on that. When they started, started the program, they needed someone to go to Tuskegee, Alabama and train all these black aviators because they were segregated to a certain area. So they used the Tuskegee Institute which was called then was Tuskegee University, Tuskegee, Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama. And they had airfields around there and they used that for the training. Well, the chief instructor was a guy named Charles Anderson, Charles Alfred Anderson. And he learned to fly. No one would teach him. Nobody would give him lessons. So at the age of 20, somehow he put some money together and borrowed some. He bought his own airplane and taught himself how to fly. Imagine doing that. And I think he, he, he joked about it. I remember meeting him at a, a dinner one time. He crashed a few times, taught himself to fly, and, and progressed. That, be, that means he knew how to fix the airplane, too. Yeah, he was also a mechanic. Yeah, yeah, he did, he did, did his maintenance, and they allowed him to join a flying club where they, they still wouldn't teach him anything, but they would just kind of give him some information to help out a little bit. And he basically built his own program. And he ended up being a flight instructor at Howard University. They started a, an aviation program, I guess, in the late 30s. Uh, then when World War II broke out, they wanted to train black pilots specifically. They chose him to be the chief instructor. That's the reason they refer to him as Chief Anderson. 
Wow. I thought he was a Navy chief or something like that. Yeah, no, he was a chief instructor. He was a civilian. And I guess one of his, one of his most cl- famous claims to fame was that there were people who questioned the, the efficacy of the whole program. And the uh, wife of the then President Franklin Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, actually came down to visit Tuskegee Institute and went into an airplane and flew with him. That's to right. find the Secret Service and all that. They they called back to Washington and said she's up flying with him. And I think Roosevelt said, Well, how is it going? He said, It's going okay. He said, Okay, very good. And that was the end of it. But there's a famous picture, and I'll, we'll I'll put it up you on YouTube. Picture. If you're watching this on YouTube or you go to wingmanshow.com, W I N G M E N show.com, you'll be able to see that picture. Yeah. And I wish I had it, but uh, before he died, he came to Memphis and uh, there was a dinner and he was there. I was in the picture. I'll see if I can find it around somewhere. He was cool. He was, he was in his, it was in his late eighties at the time. Mentally, he was like about 15 years old, just cracking jokes. And it's a hundred percent there. He's more there than I am right now. I remember that he was really, really cool guy. And there's another one I met named uh, Bernie Knighton. Didn't know anything about him. But Bernie Knighton was a uh, he was a 12. He was a 12. Yeah, he was a 12 uh, graduate of Tuskegee uh, Institute in wow. the aviation program, shot down a bunch of airplanes, uh, did a lot of things and ended up as a principal inspector for the FAA out in Los Angeles. And he had like several airlines he was in charge of. And I got a, I got a, I was getting a type rating uh, certified in a Boeing 737, paid for it myself. And he was the FAA guy that gave me the oral examination and the simulator. Oh, wonderful. Was, I was still, I was still in the Navy at the time. So I'm doing this kind of my own time, which was, uh, which was very, very challenging. And he was challenging. He was extremely challenging. That's the hardest sim experience I've ever had. Yeah, usually whenever a black person taught me in the military, they were way harder on me because they knew what I what both of us had to go through. So they did not ever let me slide. I don't know about you, but what you just talked about, believe it or not, was not black history. And this really makes me upset. That was history. You just talked about black children don't need to know what you just said. All children need to know. We need to take this out of segregated knowledge what Mm -hmm. you just said is incredible a man who taught himself how to fly the thing that got me through the thing that really got me through the navy was that i knew if they could do it and i was talking about the certain kind of white kid that i still really don't like the privilege and he doesn't i know black kids like this but Mm -hmm. that certain privilege i am better than you kid they I knew that if they could do it, I could do it. And that's all I needed. But I did that because of men like the Tuskegee Airmen that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. This has been a great show. I love you, Paul. Thank you for all that information on Tuskegee. If I can add one more thing, there's a great book. on. Here's my book recommendation by a Tuskegee Airman. His name was Charles Dryden. Great guy. Met him a couple of times. And it's a book called A-Train, Memories of a Tuskegee Airman. Man, I've got my own autographed copy. H, it's called A Train, Memories of a Tuskegee Airman. Very well written and a good book for anybody if you're interested in aviation or just life. Thank you once That's again, Dr. Paul Thompson, my friend. Thank you for your love, your time. And that's something that we won't ever get back. I want to thank all the listeners, too. Thank you so much for doing the show, Dr. Paul. We're jamming. Well, thank you, Mr. Drew, for inviting me on. Always good to talk to you. And ladies and gentlemen, Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this podcast or any of the podcasts. If you're looking at YouTube, uh, they say smash the like button. Don't smash it. Just press it gently and refer to use as a link to all your friends. You can also look at us on our website, wingmenshow.com, W-I-N-G-M-E-N, show, S-H-O-W.com, all together, wingmenshow.com. And we hope to see you in the future. Thanks again, Mr. Drew. Oh, you're welcome. And we're still floating like butterflies and stinging like bees. Rumble, you badass jet pilots, rumble. May there be peace on earth and goodwill towards all men and women.